Namaste. Well, I have some really good news, which is something I've wanted to share with you for a long time. <laughs> but because it required some additional research and development, I've been holding off on it. And now I'm happy to say that we're almost ready <laughs> to release a new spiritual technology. Well, it's not new. It's new to the West. It's very unknown in the West. But the advantage of this technology is that anybody on any level of the four darshanams can not only benefit from it, but even advance. So, this is something I've been looking for for a long time. You know, one of the things that I noticed or observed in my own work is that the knowledge has been fragmented. Uh, the people who know religion are one side, the people who know meditation are on the other side, the people who know bhakti are somewhere else, and they're all off in their own little sects or even in different countries. For example, uh, rational materialism, empiricism, has gone to the West and developed very highly there. And now it's even come back and it's taking over India. <laughs> People are giving up their culture for a little temporary, you know, scientific advancement. <laughs> And the promises of science are way, way overblown, and they're getting disappointed. Of course they're going to be disappointed, huh? because it's not a complete body of knowledge. And similarly, the people in the different sectarian groups, each has a piece of the truth. But I don't know of any group, well, up till now, <laughs> I haven't known of any group that has it all. So... It was a matter of great uh, a jubilation and, and encouragement for me to discover, not like I said, not a new path, but a path that has been neglected in the West, and even to, to some extent here in India. But it's not known to outsiders at all. That's the funny thing. You have to go deep into Tamil culture to even begin to understand it. You see, it's a matter of context. As I've said many times since the very beginning of this channel, you can go back and check. <laughs> context creates meaning. So you may even come across like the greatest secret in the universe, huh? like E equals MC squared, right? Every school child can recite it. E equals MC squared, like a parrot. You know, but can they do anything with it? Can they explain the meaning of it? Not, not just the superficial meaning of the symbols, but the deep meaning of it. No, of course not. So you may even come across the greatest secret. It's right there in the scriptures. Hmm? But without the context, you can't do anything with it. I'll give you a great example from my own life. The bhakti movement of, of uh, Krishna consciousness, which I was a part of for over 30 years, uh, I was deeply committed to it. I mean, to the point where I became a guru and everything. But there was something missing. Uh, and what was missing was its connection with the original Vedas. Its connection with the original Vedas was very sketchy, huh? Because it was essentially a sect that was created about 500 years ago. And, you know, Vedas are much older than that, at least 10 or 20,000 years. They were passed down as oral tradition. But the uh, Bhakti movement such as we know it today, has very little tangible connection with the original Vedas. Why? Huh? 
they lost their context. They got divorced from the Vedic texts because the Vedic texts are ultimately uh, Advaita. And the bhakti method that was adopted by the, especially the Krishna group was totally dvaita, duality, dualistic. Uh, but the ultimate Vedic truth is non-dual. So they kind of gradually drifted apart. Same thing happened with Buddhism. Buddhism was born in the lap of Vedic culture. It is a response to the questions that naturally arise in a person's mind, an intelligent person's mind, upon hearing the Vedic truths. So when there was a political uh, uh, rejection of Buddhism about 1,200 years ago in India, India kicked out Buddhism. There was actually a, a very bloody uh, kind of uh, revolution against Buddhism. Many millions of Buddhists were killed. Uh, this is the Buddhist Holocaust, which is not mentioned in any history books. Uh, you have to go to the Buddhist archives to even find out about it. But Buddhism was kicked out of India, so it went to Nepal, it went to Tibet, uh, it went to Sri Lanka, and, and points east, <laughs> all the way to China, Japan, like that. But that Buddhism was divorced from its original context. So a lot of it became meaningless. And it's impossible to understand without the Vedic background. <laughs> I was always amazed at seeing the Buddhist monks, you know, who follow very strictly the external regulations and rules and stuff, but they have no real understanding why they're doing what they're doing. What's the meaning of it? Where did it come from? How did it develop? They, they don't understand. This is a lack of context. Lack of context leads to lack of meaning. So similarly, when any religion or any spiritual path gets broken down into different, different sects, they become estranged from their original context and they lose their meaning. And the first thing that happens, of course, is that they get perverted, they get changed. Uh, maybe not the original words of the text, but the meaning changes. Why? Different context. Huh? If you take the Upanishads, for example, out of the context of the forest sages and you bring it into the towns and cities. It, it seems ridiculous it, and it seems meaningless. Who can sit and meditate all day? Who can go into samadhi and stay for hours and hours? Uh, not somebody that has to get up and go to work in the morning. <laughs> So what do they do, you see? So in the same way, the original, or I should say the most powerful method, the most uh, juicy and potent path given in the Vedas had lost its context uh, and, and become virtually meaningless. And then people started reading all kinds of nonsense into it and it became corrupt. The same thing happened with Ramana Maharshi. His teaching now has turned into Neo-Advaita, which is absolutely the reverse, <laughs> the opposite of his original teaching. But it persists because of market demand. People want something easy, they want something they can practice in their home, huh? in, a, in the midst of family life, and so on like that. So what to do? Well, because of my research, I was able to find this 
new path, or <laughs> it's not new, of course, but this original Vedic path uh, that has more or less languished in the secret of the, of the Tamil culture, Tamil temple culture, and Tamil sannyasi culture. And as a sannyasi, I was able to penetrate that culture, and I was able to get the meaning and restore the original context. So, now we have a method, a path, that will work for everybody, no matter what level they're on. It's a pretty outrageous claim. You know? Because most you, mostly you'll find, like the Hare Krishnas are on the dualistic level. Uh -huh. And some of the more advanced bhaktas are on the dvaita dvaita or vishishta dvaita level. And then the aspiring jnanis are on the vivartavada level. And also the, those who really follow the Buddha's teaching are on the vivartavada level. Uh, and then there's the realized sages on the ajatta vada platform. And usually they can hardly talk to each other. Why? There's no one context that can span that entire range of concepts, all the way down to Pashu on the, on the extreme low end, and all the way up to the sages of the ajatta level on the top. There's no one context. Well, yeah, actually there is. <laughs> and I've discovered it. And I'm going to be presenting it on this channel starting in the next few days. So I'm just waiting for some additional equipment. It'll be a couple of days and then I can start teaching this method. So you're going to ask, what is it? Well, I don't want to tell you what it is because then you'll prejudge it according to your current limited knowledge. See? According to your views. Huh? Oh, there was a, such a great comment by Chris Dude, which it's like a, a whole book, you know, it's long. But it begins, self-realization is not a view that you can subscribe to. It can't be, because any view is limited. By definition, a view is a narrow range of vision. And there are certain things inside it, and there are other things outside it. And you can understand the things that are inside the context of the view. But you can't understand those that are outside, and so the usual reaction is to go into denial. <laughs> this is my birdie friend comes to my bedroom window every morning. He's loud. <laughs> but um, the usual re reaction to something outside your context is rejection, isn't it? Like the Hare Krishnas, let's use that as an example again. They reject Advaita completely. I mean, they make it the enemy, they make it the devil, like, like the fundamentalist Christians are with Satan. Uh, the Hare Krishnas are with Advaita. Uh, but their philosophy, <laughs> this is such a joke, their philosophy is called Achintya Bheda Bheda Tattva. And what does Bheda Bheda mean? The same yet different. Dwaita huh? Dwaita. That it's both Dwaita and Adwaita. Well, they got the Dwaita part down pretty good, but the Adwaita part, they don't get at all. So they have also changed, you see. They've become a fundamentalist cult and lost their context, their Vedic roots. And now they're drifting on the on the waves of public sentiment. They do what sells. And what sells, of course, is the lowest common denominator, which is Dwaita, ordinary religion. So they get lost. But the real view will span the whole range, the whole context 
from bottom to top. And that's what we're going to present. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om.